Aloha and welcome to another edition of Condo Insider. Hawaii's show about association living is for directors and homeowners alike to understand their obligations uh, living in an association. That being said, today's show is about the 2017 legislature, or I should say about association matters before the 2017 legislature. We'll avoid some of the sensitive topics like rail and just focus on how the legislature did with regard to our industry. I've often been asked, where does your show come from? Who sponsors your show? And we are sponsored by the Hawaii Council of Community Associations, which is one of Hawaii's oldest industry, education, and lobbying groups in Hawaii. And we're lucky today to have my co-host and president of HCCA, Jane Sugimura. And again, welcome to the show. Thank you. And just tell us briefly about HCCA real quick. Well, we're a nonprofit. We're a Hawaii nonprofit. And we advocate for boards of directors and condominium associations and community associations now in the state legislature and the city council uh, on, on any issue that might affect you know condominium uh, living or community association living. And we do educational seminars uh, on topics that would uh, of interest uh, to board members and to owners and even vendors or people who are in the industry. Uh, that you know would uh, help us make living in condos easier and better. Yeah, I think what's interesting about your organization over many of them is all your revenue to run this program is done through individual membership and through the seminars that we run. We don't take donations from vendors or the Hawaii State Edu Real Estate Education Fund. So we're very independent and we watch our positioning very carefully so we can't be uh, accused of being in one person's favor oh, or yes, not. Yes, yes, yes. We, we, we are totally independent. Well, I think the idea behind today's show is that we're going to talk about the legislature. And Jane and I work throughout the legislative session together on various bills. So the way we've kind of decided to approach the show is we're going to divide them up. So I'll talk briefly just for a moment about, uh, not specifically, but the bills that did not pass. And then Jane's going to talk about a couple bills, and I'm going to talk about a couple bills. And at the end of the show, we're both going to give our grade of the legislature, again, for association matters only, and, uh, and then wrap the show up. So let me begin by just talking about some of the bills that didn't pass. Every year, our industry is somewhat, I'm going to call it assaulted, by independent small groups of homeowners trying to create a government entity to be responsible for condo association management in Hawaii. It's often referred to as an ombudsman. Somewhere a homeowner can go and they're unhappy about something and complain and expecting government to take in and, and tell the board that uh, you're doing it wrong, you have to change, or in some cases it's been suggested they have the right to remove a board member or to make bylaws or declarations a, a moot. And, and really, it's kind of like government housing versus private housing. We as an industry have always supported self-governance. Every building's kind of different. You know your needs and your budget, and that you elect independent people who have the same obligations to pay as a homeowner. And we believe strongly in self-governance and where there are issues with respect to uh, areas we can improve our industry, we're certainly welcome amending the laws, but we think throwing the baby out with the bathwater and bringing in a government entity to run associations uh, is not proper. And so in that sense, the ombudsman bills, the second year in a row, all died. And they did not get uh, continued, or there may have been some hearings, but in the end they died. The other bills that were uh, died briefly were that uh, because of this argument that boards of directors don't know what they're doing. There was bills that required mandatory education for board members, and even in some cases, personal financial statement disclosure uh, to a state agency to make sure those board members don't have conflicts of interest. Well, from an industry perspective, these are volunteer jobs, and, and we didn't support that program because of the fact that uh, um, we think the educational programs that exist today with respect to HCCA and CAI and the state of Hawaii are more than adequate for people. And of course, we have Condo Insider they can watch 24-7. Another quick bill that didn't uh, pass this year was there was an argument that, uh, and this was sponsored mostly by health organizations, they wanted to have the law amended that a board of directors could create a house rule to prohibit owners from renting their unit to smokers. 
So in a way, by having a house rule, if you owned in your project and you wanted to rent your unit, the board could have set up a house rule saying you have to rent it to non-smokers only. Well, there's not much equity in that. You know, certainly the wall already protects you that there's no smoking in the common elements and, and things can be done to stop smoking on the knives. But uh, we didn't feel that that was appropriate and the non-smoking bills all passed away. And finally, the last major bill I'll just briefly tell you about is what I call the manager licensing. All managing agents, and of course all associations don't have managing agents, um, if they have a managing agent, the principal of that company has to be a principal broker. So all these obligations to have crime insurance and protect your money are in existence currently. But oftentimes, the manager who comes to your board meetings is not a real estate licensee, but has been probably trained by CAI or HCCA or other organizations, IRAM, uh, to have certifications in the industry. But the idea was that there'd be some better benefit to an association require them to have real estate licenses. Well, real estate training doesn't need meet the needs of what we do in association management. But again, we're talking about the bills that died, and that bill died, and, and, and that's kind of primarily the, the four major thrusts we saw this year and last year, where there's a group to continually cry foul that the boards aren't doing a good job. So do you think boards are doing a good job? I think boards are doing a good job, and you know, I, I think that's the challenge when we go is the, the, the legislators are the ones who get the phone calls from their constituents or have friends who have, you know, or colleagues who get, you know, calls from their constituents complaining about boards. And so we have to go and, and basically address the complaints which I think are being made by a minority of associations. I think overall, uh, you know, m most associations comply with their laws, they're pretty fair, they're, you know, they're uh, reasonable, and they don't give their unit owners and residents heartburn. And we're talking about maybe a small percentage of, con I mean, there are thousands of condominium associations in the state of Hawaii, we're talking about a handful, maybe, you know, l less than, you know, 50. I think it, you know that might be a fair assessment, and you know every once in a while you know you have issues with residents or other people uh, in, in you know in the building. But you know overall, I think you know the boards are doing a, a good job and are trying their best you know to comply with their obligations. And um, so it's always a challenge to go to the legislature and try to address the, you know they're trying to paint us all boards as being dysfunctional, mean spirited and, you know, retaliatory. I mean, it just seems like, you know, I don't know where they're getting their information, but, you know, their, their view of boards of directors is so different from what, you know, I know from being on two boards. And well, as a management company owner previously, uh, you know, we managed 182 associations. I didn't see this widespread problem. Yeah. But more times than not, I found it was owners disagreeing with the board's decision and so therefore there had to be some conspiracy theory on why they made that decision that they were benefiting. Yes. You know, board members pay the same assessments, maintenance fees that everybody else does. They don't get any privilege and they certainly don't want to pay more money than they have to. But right. we get this continuing barrage of information and they want a government agency. And the problem I have with a government agency, it comes from the condo education fund or the condo registration fee. And if you look at the state of Nevada, it's grown to a complaint center which the state of Nevada admits that 99% they have no statutory authority over. It's just a place for people who are angry to, to vet their anger. You know, and I think that we're better off trying to educate the boards on uh, dispute resolutions with our value of mediation and, and teach them education how to handle these situations, recognizing that uh, probably there are occasions when a board doesn't make the best decision, but that's business judgment, right? Right, and you know, I, I agree with you and I think you know, I, I agree with you, and I think a lot of people, including some of the people who are listening today, probably don't know about the Condo Education Fund, which was set up over 20 years ago because of a lawsuit. And the legislature, you know, after hearing, uh, you know, what happened, determined, and, and there were board, people on boards who were resigning because they found out that they could be sued and judgments could be entered against them that were not covered by insurance. And so they were resigning in droves. And so the legislature decided to set up this condo ed fund, which means if you live in a condominium, every other year you are assessed an amount. And it started off a dollar and a quarter. I think it's up to $3. And so you do the math. 
you, the number of condominium units in the state of Hawaii times three dollars every other year. That's several millions of dollars. And the whole purpose of that money was to educate boards, to make books available in the public libraries that weren't available before, and to set up a, you know, a fund to fund dispute resolution. And I think that's where the focus should be for the, you know, that money, is you know, we don't want people living in buildings <coughs> suing each other, or owners suing boards and vice versa. And if there is a dispute, it has to be resolved quickly and cheaply, and so that money should be used uh, people should take advantage of that and, you know, use those, those funds to, dis, you know, resolve their, their, their disputes. Well, let's talk about some of the bills that passed. Okay. Let's talk with the beginning with 292. Tell us about 292 and what it is. Okay, well, that's an easy one. <coughs> there are two <coughs> condominium statutes, 514A and 514B. And 514B was passed in uh, 2004, became effective 2006. And it only applied to condominiums that were in existence at that time. And, and in the 10 years since that bill has, uh, uh, that law was passed, every time we had to amend the condominium statute, we had to end, amend 514A and 514B. And they had different numbers. I mean, even though the contents of both laws are pretty much the same, except for some uh, um, uh, uh, sections, provisions in 514B, that were different, they, you know, the, but then the, the sections were all different. And so it was very confusing for lawyers, for residents, for board members to, to work with these two statutes. So two, Senate Bill 292 repeals Chapter 514A, but it doesn't do it right away. It, uh, the repeal is effective on January 1, 2019. And the reason why uh, there's a year and a half is because uh, you know, changes have to be made in other statutes, and we want to make sure that if you're going to repeal something, that there is a safety net to take care of those issues in 514B. So the changes have to be made and adjustments have to be made so that when 514A goes away forever, the parts that are, are, are necessary uh, to protect people have, you know, are still available in 514B. Well, I think the, uh, the key issue on that is that and if 514B came in existence in 2006, we have 11 years now of experience. And to avoid confusion between A and B and what and wherefore, and it creates a lot of legislative complaints that people don't understand. Right. But this is a simple matter to repeal it, because it doesn't really change much. Right. You know, because B was a recodification of A, and so there are some minor changes, but nothing really uh, significant, because when we pass 514B, most of the governance section in Part 5 automatically applied even to 514A condominiums right. is why people got confused. But the issue is, I think, it was the, the developers. And what right. we heard is that there are some developers who developed their condominiums under 514A, and some of those units are still on the market, haven't been sold. But, you know, the, and, and Senator Baker said it well. You know, it's been 10 years. And so they got to do something. So they got a year and a half now to market those units, to get them sold, and, uh, and, and everybody then would be on the same page with 514B. Okay, well we're gonna take a short break right now and come back in one minute and we're gonna ruffle through the last four bills with you that passed and we'll be right back on Condo Insider. You can be the greatest, you can be the best, you can be the king come banging on your chest, you can beat the world, you can beat the war, you can talk to God, go banging on his door, you can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock, Again, welcome back to Condo Insider with Jane Sugimura talking about the 2017 legislature. At the end, we're going to give the legislature a grade, again, for association matters only because we don't want to get into all these other hot topics they had uh, in the rest of the session. That being said, number one, 
Number, bill number 292, SB 292, Senate Bill 292, repealed 514A, effective January 1, 2019. Everybody will be under 514B, January 1, 2019. I'm now going to just briefly talk about House Bill 1498. This was a common problem we've heard over and over again from some of the state agencies that the current statute provides that owners are entitled to certain documents. However, owners were finding they could not get copies of the general manager, site manager, resident manager's employment contract. And of course, there are issues raised about privacy. Well, this Senate Bill 1498 clearly states that an owner has the right and access to the resident manager, site manager, general manager's contract, although it specifically defines information that can be redacted. What cannot be redacted is their job description, compensation, bonuses, those types of things. What can be redacted would be their social security number, private cell phone number, health conditions, signature on the contract. In this electronic world, these stuff can be stolen. So now associations must provide in reasonable detail, except as defined in the statute, the uh, resident manager, site manager's contract. The other issues it clearly did was, very briefly, was if you happen to have one of those rare associations, you had mixed use, like you had classes of directors. For example, a commercial director, a restaurant director, a parking director, because the condominium itself had classes of ownership. In those cases, it clarified the existing intent of the law that if you're going to have an election or removal, that that election removal is by that class of owners. Therefore, if the parking director was elected, you couldn't have a removal petition where the residential uh, owners use their voting to remove that director uh, from, the, from the position. The third and probably most important thing it also did, rare again, is that tenants can no longer serve on a board. So if you have a commercial interest that owns a unit and they rent their units out, they can't use their voting power to elect a tenant to serve on the board of directors. It has to be an officer or some kind of official of the association. And so 1498 is very important because I always have said over and over again that production of documents is a critical right to owners. We have to honor it. And now we know the answer on employment contracts for the senior person at the project. It must be made available with certain redactions. So tell us quickly about 192 and 239. Okay, uh, these two uh, bills uh, are somewhat similar. Well, let me talk about House Bill 192 first. That one amends uh, HRS uh, for Chapter 421, and 421 deals with uh, community associations, and I guess there are some uh, homeowners associations that don't quite fit into a community association, and so this bill include, expands the definition of association to include them. And I know that there is uh, some uh, effort that will, you know, Senator Baker has indicated that she would like to expand 421 because there aren't a whole lot of uh, provisions in that statute and, and the people who live in community associations really want benefits that, you know, the condo people, condo unit owners have in Chapter 514 A and B. And so there's discussion and thought about expanding 421J to accommodate homeowners. Because you can't take five, four, the condo statute and say, okay, we'll apply it to homo, uh, community associations and we'll just include them in it because they're like apples and oranges. So they have to have their own uh, piece of uh, legislation. But in both House Bill 192 and uh, House Bill 239, it amends the provisions on proxies. And these are the proxies that you use at the annual meeting. And it would be the same for a community association and for a condominium. Is the a proxy has, has, has got four boxes. Well, the first one, I think, is that the proxy goes to the board of directors. The second one goes is that it goes to the members of the board uh, equally. And I think one the box is where you can fill a name. You can name your neighbor. You can name your brother. Anybody you, know, you want to, to hold your proxy and vote it. And this, uh, the fourth box is uh, for quorum purposes only. And the legislature was told that with these uh, uh, proxies that were approved by the association that have these four boxes, that if there were no boxes checked or if more than one was checked, that that proxy went to the board. 
And so this bill clarifies it and says, if you do not mark any boxes or you mark more than one, which clearly means that, you know, there's been no direction to whomever, uh, to anybody as to what you should do with the proxy, that it goes to quorum purposes only, doesn't go to the board. That's what that, the uh, 192 and 239 do. Yeah, because the whole issue in that proxy issue came about because the original industry proxy said if it's more than one box checked or none, it goes to quorum only. Some boards got very clever and substituted the language that goes to the board of directors for voting, which means you're stacking a deck for the board. Right. And so this law basically says you can't do that. It's quorum only. So we're going back to, and that was very rare, I have to say. Most boards did the quorum only anyway. But right. there were a few people that, uh, that, that didn't do that. So. So far, we've, we've gone through three bills, and I'm going to talk about my favorite, House Bill 832. And it goes back to some of the shows I've said before that owners have a right to participate in board meetings. In fact, I should pull it out here. I have a question that came from our seminar we did today, which is very applicable to this, that owners should have a right to speak at board meetings. They should have a right to deliberate. The law says they should have a right to participate in deliberations. Well, what happens is boards would put rules out that would say you can only talk in the forum and you couldn't speak anymore in the meeting, which is not the intent of the law. So this bill did several things. Number one, it clearly delineated that owners have the right to participate in the deliberation of board meetings. However, boards can set reasonable rules. And I didn't get a chance to ask the, answer the question today because we ran out of time. The best way you can do that is start your meeting with a forum and say, what do you want to talk about? Maybe there's something to talk about you want to add to the agenda. Well, then you go into your meeting, and what you do is you say, we're going to discuss painting the building blue or pink. And you have your discussion, and the rules should be, OK, the board's going to discuss it first. And before we take a vote, we're going to let owners make any comments. So you go back and forth, paint the blue, paint the building pink. OK, we're going to take a vote now. Did any of the owners here like to make a comment? Because under the law, the board has the right to set limits. But all you want to do is be able to give them a chance to express their opinions and feelings. And there's nothing wrong with that. And this question I had at the seminar today was that a, uh, a, uh, oh, they, they have a very formal process of approving the agenda, and they stick to the agenda, and they don't let owners speak at the rest of the agenda. Is it, are they going to be breaking the law? And I'm not a lawyer, but I'd say yes. The idea behind this is you would have your agenda, recognizing that Robert Rules allows you to amend the agenda any time during the meeting anyway. But you go to your agenda, and you simply say to the owners before you take a vote, would anybody like to make any comments about this? And if they're talking too long, and say, look, we have to limit this to two minutes. So would you please wrap it up? We appreciate your being here and your comments. And then you make your vote, or you defer to whatever you're going to do. So that bill clarifies that, they're, that owners have a right to participate in the meetings. And you can't cut them off by saying the forum only. And you certainly can have reasonable rules. What else it did, though, is two other little things. Maybe three of the little things. Well, two little things, one big thing. The two little things are, is when you publish your board notice at the project, typically three days or more before the meeting, you now have to put on that notice the expected items to be on the agenda. Expected items. It doesn't prohibit you from adding items, deleting items, or changing things. But it's to give the idea a general take of what you expect to discuss at the meeting. So that now has to be on the notice of the meeting. Then number two, after the meeting, you must have available to the owners upon request, within 30 days, a draft of the unapproved minutes. Granted, when they're approved, they might change, whatever, but you still have to have a draft set of minutes available to the owners upon request within 30 days of the meeting. But the big ticket item, the big change they made, was, as we've talked previously, getting boards and our owners to arbitration or mediation under the current statute. And that arbitration is a de novo, kind of a non-binding, squirrely, kind of different kind of arbitration, but it's there. The biggest problem we've had in dispute resolution is people don't want to go. So what this statute says is that for you board members, it may be a breach of your fiduciary duty if you fail to go to mediation or arbitration upon request. And that means, depending on what the circumstances are, you may not be protected by your director and officer liability insurance. And it's very easy to cure this problem. You can, first of all, vote for going to mediation or arbitration, which is kind of a safe harbor provision. So if the others don't, you're safe. Or you can simply look at it simply this way. 
It's our obligation to go to mediation or arbitration. We can avoid being a breach of duty by simply going. And so that's in the statute under 832. And it's, it's a good thing, you know, and uh, we, uh, we believe it's a, it's a proper thing to do because we have found that success in this evaluative mediation has been very high. And this encourages, almost demands boards to honor their obligation under the statute, which currently says shall go to mediation. It doesn't say optional. So this is what the 832 does. I think it's a good bill. And I think the one that didn't get through is, uh, or I should say still alive going into the next session, is 1499. And we have about two or three minutes left. So try to give us a short summary of that. OK, 1499, uh, it, it talks about this uh, priority of payments. Uh, 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 in other words, how, when, when, when you, the unit owner makes a payment and if they have late fees and, and penalties, uh, how, does, how do the payments get applied? Uh, and so there are changes that uh, are contemplated that are being made to that because uh, a, a lot, it's very confusing to unit owners, ends up in default and sometimes foreclosure. Uh, another thing that the bill does is, it, the, you talked about arbitration. This, there's another uh, pr uh, uh, type of uh, arbitration, and this is voluntary binding arbitration. And here the parties can do it, and, and this way, this arbitration has no de novo provision, and it would be subsidized by the Real Estate Commission. So that means if you do this type of uh, arbitration, you pay the initial fee, and then uh, the board subsidizes it, and it expands who can participate in mediation. Yeah, now it's kind of still alive, because we're, 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 our session has last two years. But in summary, we have 514B is going to be the rule of the land in 2019. Certain associations, mostly in the Big Island, are kind of orphans and aren't under any law, are going to be under 421J. We're going to have proxies that can only be used for a quorum only if they're mismarked. 832, more open board meetings, some requirements to be more disclosure, what's going to be done at the meeting, and, uh, and uh, make sure violations of fiduciary duty are, 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 are limited to not going to mediation arbitration giving the resident manager's contract, and this one is still outstanding, 1499. So what is your report card for the legislature this year? Re remembering that we're talking about association issues only. I give them an A minus, mainly for what they didn't do and because of the, 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 the bills that they, they passed about mediation and arbitration. Yeah, I would give them a B plus. Yeah. And I think that from our industry, we're finding the legislature's learning more about our industry. They're more in tune with what's really going on. I think so. We're, we're really trying to work on ways to improve the flaws in the law to protect owners' rights without going to the necessity of, of government housing with a, a government agency to run condominiums. Right, and, so, I, and I agree. And I think they recognize, too, that boards are trying to do their jobs, and they've you know, given them some, some guidance with some of these bills. So as we wrap up the show, I just want to say we owe a lot of credit to Hawaii Council Community Associations. They put a great deal of work in running great educational seminars and also uh, lobbying at the legislature for meaningful legislation. Owners and board members alike are welcome to come to any of these seminars. You can check us out online and sign up. We do, uh, I don't know, seven or eight a year, if I remember correctly. And so um, we hope you enjoyed the show today, and uh, thank you for watching Condo Insider. Aloha.